the amazing dot, dot, dot of grace. There's a lot of things amazing dot, dot, dot of grace. The amazing power of grace. The amazing mercy and forgiveness of grace. The amazing supply of grace. And, and, and the amazing peace and joy of grace. In fact, grace is a synonym for God. The Bible says that Jesus is my Savior. And the Bible says I am saved by grace. So grace has to be all God. Because nobody can save me except all God. And whenever I talk about being saved by grace, it's the same as saying I'm saved by Jesus. And there's so much power in Jesus, we can't even calculate it. We can't even estimate it. It's beyond the farthest anyone can imagine or comprehend. I heard a story this week that I read, it's probably five or six years ago. And I heard it this week from a firsthand witness, a, a man who actually knew this person that this happened to. And there's a young fellow who was in a bad, tough a mean gang in L.A. They say that L.A. has the biggest gang problem of anywhere in the world, and this was one of the biggest and baddest gangs in L.A. And he was a typical gangbanger, and he had himself tatted all up everywhere, and, and just, if I remember right, he even shaved his head and had some stuff on top of his head that I can't repeat. And it's a sad life for him, but you wonder, how did he get there? And how many times I've been out in, in, in ministry to the, to, the, to, the, to the, well, the wrong side of town, the bad side of town, or even, even, uh, even overseas in third world countries, and you've been in some pretty rough neighborhoods. And we went, uh, one time we had to have 24-7 machine gun guards for us everywhere we went, while we were asleep, whatever. They wouldn't let us come to the country, Christians. It was not a Christian country. And they said, you've got to have armed guards. I said, okay, we'll do that. And we got pulled over one time by some, by some of the rebel faction. And I think, I don't know how long it took them, but our guys finally gave them some money, and we, we, we got to go. But this guy grew up, and I've been in these places, and I see these rough and hardened uh, criminals full of violence and anger and hate and I don't know how many times the Holy Spirit has spoke to me and said, and he, he would say to me and he'd press me and say, this person was once a tiny little baby in his or her mother's arms. And, and it was like the Holy Spirit would, would ask me, do you know what happened to this baby to get this baby to this? And I had to admit, no, I don't, I don't understand those things. I, I sure don't like it. That's just a conversation I had with the Lord. Many times I've had that conversation. Went to the, a prison in Africa. And I tell you, the prisons there, if, if the prisons were like that here, there'd be a lot less people willing to commit crimes that would send them to prison. It definitely has to be, it would be a deterrent for me. They slept on concrete floors. If someone, some family member could afford it, they might bring them a worn out, bath towel to sleep on the concrete floor. They took their showers outside. There were no indoor showers, and there were no walls around the showers, and the, and the city could walk by and look. And it makes you wonder, how can that happen to the human race? How can these things actually happen to the human race? Well, this man was invited to go with a minister to, to address a crowd of a thousand people. The minister asked him, would you go along and share your story? He didn't want to do it. He was really shy and didn't like to be up front because he had gotten converted under this minister. He was just a new convert in Christ over in L.A. And they went to Virginia. And they flew over there. And he got up and he started trying to tell his story. And he had to stop and weep many times because it was so terrible. But then he got to the 
the really hard part. Some of you maybe read this story or heard it. When he was a little boy, about six or seven years old, his mom would beat him so bad she didn't want him, and she'd beat him so bad that he would bleed on his back really bad. And it was so bad that he was so embarrassed about it that he would wear three shirts. He put the first shirt on, but the blood would still be oozing through the first shirt. So he'd put the second shirt on, and the blood would still come through a little bit there. It took three shirts, thick shirts, to keep the blood from oozing through. He didn't want his classmates to know that he was being beaten like that and bleeding like that. No bandaging. It was a poor, down, down in a third world nation. And they'd make fun of him because he was wearing three shirts and be 100 degrees. They'd laugh at him and mock him and tell him how crazy he was. Don't you know it's 100 degrees? But he couldn't, he couldn't stand to let them know what was going on. He couldn't, he couldn't, he couldn't finish that story. He, he broke down and wept in front of a thousand people and pretty soon a thousand people were standing to their feet and they were weeping and then he told them how that Jesus had come into his life and he'd forgiven his mother. Don't tell him there's no grace. Don't tell him that grace has no power. Don't tell his mama that there's no grace. That there is no God. And that grace does not cleanse. Don't tell him that grace does not heal. Don't tell him that grace does not change a person and takes ashes and turns ashes into pure gold. There may be somebody here today. You've never made a full, real commitment to Jesus. But you know it's way past time. You may be here today and you've just been playing games, playing church, playing everything. And you know you've, you've overstayed your time in the pig pen because that's what the world is. The whole thing's a pig pen. It may not look like it all the time. The devil, he... He disguises it pretty good. He dresses it up real nice, makes it look real good. But there may be somebody here, you've been so long in the pig pen, you can't even see the pigs anymore. You can't even see the muck that you're wallowing in. But you know, you know that Jesus is worth following, and you know that Jesus will take you back. Those are two, two, two people I'm talking to right there. And then there's a third group. There's a third group. You, you're living the, the Christian life. You're saying your prayers. You're studying your Bible. But you need full cleansing. You need the anointing of the Holy Spirit that gives power to invite people to follow Jesus. You don't quite have that power. You don't quite have that nerve to talk to people about Jesus. You just haven't quite gotten there, but you want to get there, and you know that's where God wants you, and you know that that place is overflowing with power, with holy power. Maybe, maybe you don't trust that you have the wisdom to know how to talk to people who are in rebellion against God. Maybe you just don't trust yourself. Well, that's a good thing, but you can trust Jesus. So there's three people that I'm calling for on this invitation to come to Jesus. And you know, maybe you want to take communion today, but you know that you don't even know what's going on. You don't understand. What is repentance? You know, the Bible says repent and be baptized. 
A lot of people get baptized and they never repented. There's a lot of people who think repentance is just asking God to forgive you of your sins. But they don't understand what the word forgive really means. The word forgive means to cleanse and to change from doing something. In Psalm 103, 103 verse 12, here's how big grace is. Psalm 103 verse 12 says that God takes our sins and removes them as far as the east is from the west. It says he has removed them as far as the east is from the west. A lot of people got baptized and they never even surrendered their sin. They never even said, Jesus, take my sins as far as the east is from the west. I not only don't want to sin anymore, I don't even want to be tempted anymore. I want you to surround me with your presence so mighty and so powerful and so incredible that all I'm, all I'm doing is playing offense. I'm running for you to score the kingdom every time I run. I don't even want to be tempted anymore. God loves to hear that. That's why he put it in the Lord's Prayer. Lead us not into temptation. You want a transliteration of that? Don't let us be tempted anymore, Lord. We just want to be busy on your errands. Doing what you do. Enoch got there. Elijah got there. I believe Moses got there or God wouldn't have raised him from the dead and taken him to heaven. Here's one for you. A lot of people use the Apostle Paul and say, as soon as you die, you go to heaven because he says, I am, I am really in a conflict, he says. I don't know whether to, to be absent from the body and present with the Lord, which is better for me, or to remain here and, and minister the gospel, which is better for you. And they use that to say, see, when you die, you go straight to heaven because he was going to be dying, he was going to be absent, go straight to heaven. What if, and I think it's a really big possibility. What if God came to Paul, who was Saul of Tarsus one time, and he said, Paul, I'm going to let you choose. You want me to take you to heaven the way I did Enoch or the way I did Moses? Or are you willing to lay down your life? Do you want to die for the church so they'll be inspired of your faith for the rest of your existence? He said it was far better for him to die and depart and go and be with the Lord. He said, but I know that people need the gospel that I have. I don't know what the story is exactly, but I know there's some other Greek, there's some grammar in there that doesn't allow for dying and going straight to heaven in the Greek. It's amazing what the enemy can do with grammar. But it's even more amazing what God can do with grammar. So if you've never really repented, and that means, God, I'm sorry for what I did, for all that I've done that's wrong. I ask you to forgive me, and I ask you to cleanse me as far as the east is from the west, and that includes changing me one day at a time. From glory to glory, change me, Jesus, into your likeness. Those are three groups. And really, unless you understand, unless you're praying that prayer of repentance, forgive me, cleanse me, and change me, you should not take of this table. If you're not old enough to understand it, you shouldn't take of it. If you are older, old enough to understand it, you should be baptized next Sabbath if you haven't been baptized. Amen. If you're willing to give your life to Jesus, you're willing to let him change you, you're willing to let him turn you into a beautiful vessel that reflects his glory, his wisdom, his loveliness, his, his ambition to save every sinner. If you're willing to be changed into that beautiful image then, and you haven't been baptized, you need to get baptized. We'll fill the tank. I'll fill it. We'll baptize you five hours from now because that's how long it takes to fill it. But if you came in here today and you've never made a full surrender, I'm begging you for your own sake to do it today. And for Jesus' sake, he deserves you 
The devil does not. If you came in here today and you've been monkeying around and playing games and wasting your time and energy on sin and you know Jesus will take you back, I'm calling you to come up here too. Not for me, but for Jesus and for yourself. If you, if you haven't quite, if you know that you need more power so that God can use you, he needs to cleanse and purify you so that he can use you to invite people to come to Jesus, invite people to even think about Jesus, or to even mention something about Jesus. If you know you need to be cleansed a little more and replaced with his holiness so you can do those things of God, then we're calling for you. We're going to sing this song. I'm going to look at the words with you first. Purify my heart. Let me be as Jesus and precious silver. Let me be as gold. Purify my heart. Let me be as gold, pure cold. Refiner's fire. My heart's one desire is to be holy. You know what holy means is to be set apart for a special purpose. For a holy purpose. God's the only way. He wants to take you and set you over here for eternal purposes. To help heal people. To help rescue people. That's what it means. I choose to be holy. I choose for you, Jesus, to take me from where I'm at and put me over here where you are. I choose to be holy. Set apart from my master, ready, always ready to give an answer, to do your will. Purify my heart. Cleanse me from within. Come into my heart, Jesus. Cleanse me deep within. As we sing this song, you're welcome to come right up here and sing it from here. Just keep looking forward. Please come for Jesus, if he is calling you. Purify my heart. Let me be as gold and precious silver. Yes, go. to be
We're going to say a prayer, and then we're going to go serve each other in the uh, gymnasium service of humility where we wash each other's feet. And you may be sitting here today, and you do not have the courage. You do not have the power to wash somebody's feet. Well, Jesus is that power. And you're sitting here today, and maybe you didn't have the courage to come up here. And Jesus is, is cool with that too. You know, you, you don't have to come up to the front of a church to be saved. Most people are saved out there. Out in the streets. Out in their homes. Driving down the road in their car. So, these folks that came up here this morning, I don't know what group they're in. But God knows. He's the one that searches our hearts. He shows us when there's things that we don't even know about that cause us trouble. He reveals the things to us that we don't even know are hurting us or hurting our loved ones right now. The way we behave or the, the choices we make or our habits. There's things in our lives that we don't even recognize as being harmful. I mean, he'll help us all. And we're going to have a special prayer, but here's the prayer we're going to have. I'm going to ask everybody up front here, I'm going to just trust the Holy Spirit to take care of business because that's who he is. I'm going to ask you all to get into groups of two or three. And I'm going to say a quick prayer, and I'm going to ask you to repeat it in your groups. I want you to be joined together with somebody. And I'm going to say a prayer, and I'm going to ask you to repeat it. And... Uh, it's such an important prayer. I wrote it down, and I don't want to mess it up, so I'm going to read it. And that's not a problem. You're going to repeat it. So, same difference. But God will hear this prayer. And when you hear this prayer, you'll know why I wrote it down. I don't, I don't want to make any Paul Lundgren mistakes here today. Because there may be somebody up here who's never given their life to Jesus. And you know... All of us need to give our lives to Jesus every day. So these kind of prayers need to be a daily, daily part, part of our daily prayers. And I'm going to ask everybody out there, too, to repeat this prayer. As, as you hear it, your brains work so fabulously. Your brains are so incredible because amazing grace made your brain. And especially when this prayer is prayed, amazing grace helps people hear it real quick, and they know whether they want to say it to God or not. Real quick. People know right away if they want to say this to God. And as, as it happens, if it's something you want to say to him, you're, please do that. And everybody repeat. In fact, uh, Esper, can you bring your mic down here? And, and that means yourself too. <laughs> I'm going to ask my sweet wife. She did this when she was nine years old. And, and praise God for that. Because if she hadn't, she wouldn't have been around for me to find. I'm really sure about that because she prayed that the Lord would let her marry a preacher. She didn't really handpick this one, but <laughs> God works in mysterious ways. So, Esper, I'm going to ask you to repeat out loud and lead the group as they repeat. This is for our King. This is for our Savior. This is for the one who laid down on that cross that day. He was watching the Father while the Father took your sins and mine and put them on Him. Jesus saw that coming. I know He did. That's why He cried out, My God, my God, why have you done this to me? Why have you forsaken me? He saw the Father. Isaiah 53 says, The Father has laid on Him all of our sins. Jesus watched it. He cried out that day so that you wouldn't have to cry out someday in a lost situation. So if this hits your mind and your heart, please repeat it with Esper as we pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I repent of my sin. I repent of my sin. And receive you into my life to be my Lord and Savior. And receive you into my life to be my Lord and 
Savior. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving me. I love you forever. I love you forever. Amen. 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 If you prayed your prayer, if you prayed that prayer, you just received the creator of the universe into your heart. You just became able potentially to do anything that Jesus ever did in his human life down here. Because he said, if you believe in me, you will be able to do the very things I did. And then he went off the chart and he said, and you'll be able to do greater things because I'm going to the Father. I'm your big brother, he said. I'll be at the side of the Father and we'll be watching you to help you and to teach you and to give you the kingdom. That's exciting. That is exciting. And it's exciting to walk in his footsteps. That's why we wash feet. Jesus said, as you have seen me do to you, you should do to each other. Now that stretches all the way from 30 A.D. to 2018. It's present truth. We should always do for each other what Jesus has done for us. God bless you as you go. The couples will be in the far right corner in the gym. The men will be in the close right corner, the first turn right, right corner in the gym. Ladies will be washing each other's feet in the far left corner.